Here we go on chapter 10, Hazardous Materials and Warning Systems. This is our last chapter in the book. The objectives of this chapter are to describe the U.S. Department of Transportation Hazardous Material Warning Systems, including its advantages and disadvantages. To describe the National Fire Protection Association Standard 704 Warning System, including its advantages and disadvantages and to explain the requirements, purposes, and value of material safety data sheets to first responders. To explain the types of information available for first responders contained in the 2008 Emergency Response Guidebook. To describe the responsibilities and duties of state and local emergency planning committees and how their plans and documents assist first responders with information. And finally, to explain the issues that make weapons of mass destruction incidents complex and the reasons for the development of the National Incident Management System. This chapter provides an overview of the systems designed to warn first responders of the dangers of hazardous materials. It reviews legislative actions designed to control hazardous materials and provides first responders with an overview of regulations enacted for those who are likely to encounter accidentally or intentionally release hazardous materials. In the 1940s, new types of emergency incidents began to emerge in the United States. These incidences were linked to behavior of certain chemicals, petroleum, and nuclear products that began to appear in the marketplace as products of convenience. The basic building blocks of these products were called hazardous materials. They came to the attention of first responders when they were misused or involved in the unattended fires or mishaps. Today, many of these hazardous materials become a vital part of culture as they made it possible to enjoy many conveniences of modern living. Eliminating these hazardous materials from a society is not possible. Therefore, it is vital that their usage is as safe as possible by effectively controlling their handling, transportation, and storage. In the 1940s, only a few hazardous products were available to the public. By the early 70s, demand for them grew significantly, and with an increase in demand, more problems began to surface. It became apparent that something needed to be done to control the handling of these substances. At the national level, the federal government began to address the problem of abandoned hazardous wastes. The concern resulted in Congress enacting the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976, which was followed by the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act in 1980 and the Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act in 1986. These three important legislative documents were signed by President Carter and Reagan and they combined to form the basis of the Superfund program and provides the funding to mitigate the release of hazardous substances. Other legislation and federal actions have resulted in the National Oil and Hazardous Pollution Contingency Plan, the NCP. This plan is des designed to assist local communities in preventing and mitigating harm from hazardous material releases. Local first responders have been assigned duties and responsibilities under this plan. A review of the plan and its requirements should be conducted by all local agencies. In an effort to provide better federal agency coordination, the National Response Team, NRT, was formed, bringing together 14 federal agencies to provide assistance to states with the emergency response planning, as well as assistance during major hazardous material emergencies. As co-chairs of the NRT, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the U.S. Coast Guard play major roles in environmental protection. These two agencies provide waterway protection. The EPA has inland water responsibility, while the Coast Guard handles coastal waters and specifically designated federal navigable waters such as Lake Michigan. Together, these organizations and related laws are re responsible for the implementation of federal programs for preventing, mitigating, and responding to the release of hazardous substance that might threaten human health and the environment. Two warning systems have a specific purpose or function to 
provide a heads up warning for first responders. They are the hazardous material placards utilized in transportation and the color coded hazardous warning systems for fixed facilities. The two organizations responsible for these warning systems are the U.S. Department of Transportation, the DOT, and the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA. The U.S. Department of Transportation is a federal agency responsible for the regulations for safe transportation of hazardous materials in various transportation modes. The DOT has established a required warning system for the use on vehicles transporting hazardous materials on highways. This system divides hazardous materials into nine major, major classifications of hazards and then into further subdivisions to assist in specific identification of a substance. A class 1 hazard are explosives, a class 2 hazard are gases, a class 3 hazard are flammable liquids or combustible liquids, a class 4 is flammable solids, a class 5 are oxidizers, a class 6 poisonous materials, a class 7 radioactive materials, a class 8 corrosives, and class 9 miscellaneous hazardous materials. The Emergency Response Guide states that its purpose is to provide a primary guide to aid first responders to quickly identify the specific or generic hazards of a material involved in the incident and to protect themselves and the public during the initial response phase. Even though the ERG does not provide specific information of every hazardous material, this disadvantage may be overcome by checking the bill of lading, which should be attached to the transportation agency's documentation. Once the specific materials are identified, the ERG contains basic recommendations regarding handling, mitigating, and evacuation procedures. A helpful feature of the ERG is the inclusion of the recommendation, isolation, and evacuation distances and response guidelines with special instructions for specific products. Phone numbers and other contact information are also included. First responders must also remember that exceptions to the transportation regulations may allow certain materials to be shipped without labels, placards, or markings. Such exceptions occur often in the transportation industry. The National Fire Protection Association is a nonprofit corporation with the mission of reducing the impact and burden of fire and other hazards in communities. One of the many functions of the NFPA is the development of the consensus-based codes and standards. The NFPA has developed 300 codes and standards covering many buildings, processes, services, and equipment installations in the United States. The warning method used for materials stored in buildings is the National Fire Protection Association 704 system. The NFPA 704 standard for placards is vital to providing a warning to first responding units. The NFPA 704 placard system is used as a method to warn emergency responders that hazardous materials are stored in storage tanks, small containers, and fixed facilities. A color and numbering system provides first responders with a warning that hazardous materials are stored in, or handled on the premises. Again, this requirement does not provide the first responder with specific information regarding the substance, but similar to the DOD requirement, the building owner is required to have an MSDS containing specific material information on hand. The placards are diamond-shaped figures divided into four quadrants, each which is color-coded corresponding with one of three hazards, blue for health hazards, red for flammability hazards, and yellow for chemical reactive hazards, and numbered 0 to 4, with 4 indicating the greatest degree of hazard to designate the degree of the relevant hazard. The fourth or bottom quadrant is used to warn of special hazards, such as water reactivity or a material is an oxidizer. Other hazard sides include the trifold, which is used to indicate a radiation hazard, ALK for alkalis, and CORR for corrosives. Here are two examples of what the NFPA 704 hazardous warning placards look like. 
Like the DOT warning system, the NFPA placard system also provides a quick visual system by using color-coded placards that, dis that are displayed on the exterior of a building. It warns the first responder to take notice of hazardous materials stored in the building. However, a disadvantage is, is that many fixed plant facilities have more than one hazardous product on hand. While each chemical may have an NFPA placard on its packing carton, the placard located on the exterior of the business summarizes the highest hazard of each individual categorized chemical. This illustration shows you exactly what the numbers on the NFPA placard identification system mean. So under flammability, if you have a 4, that tells you you have a flammable gas, a volatile liquid, or a pyrophoric material. A 3 means it can ignite at room temperature. A 2, it can ignite when slightly heated. A 1, it needs to be preheated to burn. And a 0, the liquid will not burn. Under reactivity, a 4 can detonate or explode under normal conditions. A 3 can detonate or explode if strong initiating source is used. A 2, a violent chemical change if temperature and pressure levels are elevated. A 1, unstable if heated. And a 0, normally stable. And under the health category, a 4, a severe severe health hazard. A three is a serious health hazard. Two, moderate health hazard. One, slight hazard. And zero, no hazard at all. Under the 1986 Emergency Planning and Community Rights to Know Act, otherwise known as the EPCRA, each state governor designates a State Emergency Response Committee, also called a CERC. The CERC in turn designate local emergency planning districts and then appoint a local emergency planning committees, a LEPIC. The CERC supervises and coordinates the activities of the LEPIC, establishing procedures for receiving and processing public requests for information collected under the terms and regulations and reviews local emergency response plans. The membership of the LEPIC must include local official, officials such as police, fire, civil defense, public health, transportation, and environmental professionals, as well as representatives of facilities subject to emergency planning requirements, community groups, and the media. The LEPICs have a responsibility of developing an emergency response plan for the jurisdiction, ensuring an annual review, and providing information to the community about chemicals stored within the community. The four major area requirements to protect the community and first responders from hazardous release are emergency planning, emergency release notification, hazardous chemical storage reporting, and toxic chemical release inventory. In some cases, even the material safety data sheets will not provide the emergency responder with enough specific information on a chemical or compound and how to deal with it during an emergency situation. The Chemical Manufacturers Association has made information available to ensure the latest data is available to first responders. One method of obtaining this information is via the internet through the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, or Chemtrack. Supplementing the telephone hotline, the Chemical Manufacturers Association announced the creation of an online database system that will be updated daily by the chemical manufacturers. Using the MSDS as the starting point, first responders can access the system via the internet to obtain the most up-to-date, accurate information. The guide to Chemtrack for emergency responders can be downloaded online at www.chemtrack.com. The primary mission of the Environmental Protection Agency is to protect and enhance our environment. In conducting this mission, it assumes the responsibility as the lead agency for carrying out Title III reporting and training requirements. The EPA also has the responsibility for hazardous waste site operations and Superfund waste site cleanup activities. The EPA also serves as the chair for the 14 federal agencies that participate in the National Response Team. 
As discussed, the National Response Team is available to local communities to provide assistance and coordination between federal, state, and local agencies. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the EPA together have developed a chemical reactivity worksheet for first responders. The worksheet provides the hazardous properties of chemicals and gives the hazards involved with mixing a number of chemicals as specified by the user. The Coast Guard offers a chemical and hazardous response information system. This CD-ROM information base contains physical data and emergency procedures in a searchable format. Local fire departments have the responsibility of notifying the Coast Guard when hazardous material release will impact coastal waters. The EPA has the responsibility for inland waters. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health is a federal agency under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that is responsible for investigating the toxicity of workroom environments and all other matters relating to safe industrial practices. The NIOSH publishes a guide to chemical hazards, which is an excellent source for obtaining health hazards relating to hazardous materials. This guide can be found online. Other activities NIOSH conduct are the testing and certification of respiratory and other protective devices, along with the testing of air sampling detector tubes. Under the leadership of the FBI, the National Domestic Preparedness Office, the NDPO, is a clearinghouse for all weapons of mass destruction. The NDPO serves as a single program and policy coordination office for domestic preparedness programs for state and local communities. The NDPO is created to act only as a coordinating and facilitating point for all efforts in training, information dissemination, and standards in policy development relating to terrorist incident response. Several sources in the Department of Defense have interests and expertise in biological and chemical terrorism. Currently, the U.S. Army Soldier and Biological Command, the SBC-COM, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground administers domestic preparedness training programs. This program is designed to assist the training of first responders in the largest U.S. cities. The SBCCOM has the responsibility for developing the standards and tests for chemical protective clothing, which in many cases is far superior to the protective clothing now available in the civilian marketplace. Although some of the information is classified, specific assistance may be provided if requested through the FBI NDPO representative. The SBCCOM also maintains a hotline providing real-time referrals that can be utilized by local agencies. In the past, the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have provided training to state and local emergency personnel who would assist in a response to an incident or emergency at a DOE or NRC licensed facility. More recently, the DOE has started to provide training to state and local emergency personnel along major U.S. transportation corridors that carry radiological materials. There are materials which undergo spontaneous transformation and release radiant energy or atomic particles. Three forms of radioactivity that are a concern to firefighters are alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Alpha radiation particles are the least dangerous as long as these particles remain outside of the body. Protective clothing and respiratory protection can provide protection against alpha radiation. Beta radiation particles have a higher energy level than alpha radiation and can travel through the air from 10 to 100 feet. Turnout clothing and respiratory protection generally provide enough protection against beta particles, but they are hazardous if swallowed or come into contact with the skin. The most dangerous form of radiation is ga gamma radiation. It consists of electromagnetic rays similar to x-rays, and these rays easily penetrate the human body. Protection, protection from external radiation can be accomplished three ways, time, distance, and shielding. The shorter amount of time exposure to the radiation, the smaller radiation dose. 
the further distance from the source of the radiation, the smaller the dose. And certain dense materials such as lead, concrete, or earth and water will stop some radiation rays. The thickness of the shielding depends on the type of material giving off the radiation, the amount of radiation, and the distance from the source. In all cases involving radiation, the wearing of full PPE and SCBA is required. However, certain caution must be taken because some situations require additional protective equipment to enter the area safely. Almost all radioactive material can be used to construct a radiological dispersal device, an RDD, such as a fission product, spent fuel from nuclear reactors, and medical, industrial, and research waste. For the greatest damaging effect, the most radioactive of fissile material would be used as the active ingredient of the RDD. An RDD would likely to have a significant impact on the target population. An uninformed society may contribute to the terrorist objectives because they are more likely to initiate widespread panic and disperse away from the target area. Unless the public has a basic understanding of nuclear, biological, and chemical terrorism, any use of RDD is like, likely to invoke fear of nuclear war. The disadvantages of RDDs over nuclear weapons involves the use of explosive materials to spread large amounts of radioactive materials greater distances. If using radioactive waste, which is different than fissile material, the terrorists and the first responder handlers are more likely to become inadvertently contaminated by the radiation, since radioactive wastes are highly contaminatable. Of importance for first responders is to determine the possibility of safely entering the contaminated areas by, ha by having the capability to measure the radiation present and protect themselves while entering the area. Here's an illustration of a firefighter in full turnout PPE gear. Uh, alpha particles will not penetrate PPE gear, they'll bounce right off it. Whereas beta particles mostly uh, will bounce off it also. Unless you have high yield beta particles from an explosion, um, they could pass into the PPE. And gamma rays, PPE doesn't stand a chance. Uh, gamma rays will go right through it. The amount of emergency exposure to radiation by first responders is usually allowed to exceed those amounts considered tolerable to persons who work continuously with radioactive materials. This is accomplished by raising the exposure within the limits for a single dose. This is considered acceptable as long as certain limits are not exceeded. The National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement has recommended that in a life-saving action such as a search for and removal of injured persons for entry to prevent conditions that would injure or kill numerous persons, entry may be permitted as long as the whole body exposure does not exceed 100 rem. In addition to hazardous materials, firefighters are faced with other materials that present a serious safety threat. Since the early 1960s, many terrorist acts have taken place in Northern Ireland and the Middle East. Most Americans, although concerned about the loss of innocent lives, were not personally impacted as these acts occurred overseas. Starting in the late 70s into the 1980s, terrorist acts against Americans stationed overseas occurred more often, and within the U.S. borders, more acts of violence begin to occur. The situation in the United States has escalated since the early 1990s. The 93 bombing of the World Trade Center, the 95 bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, the subsequent 2001 World Trade Center attack, all point out that first responders as well as the American public face a serious threat. During the same period, terrorists began to use a variety of materials to attack their targets. Today we term these materials used by terrorists as weapons of mass destruction. The term contains the use of hazardous materials, the use of nuclear radiation, as well as biological agents, chemicals, explosives, and cyber and agricultural agents. All are designed to kill or seriously injure numerous people. First responders must be trained, equipped, and prepared to handle these attacks efficiently and safely. 
Weapons of mass destruction attacks are more difficult and different than usual incident responses. The four areas of difficulties include a large number of persons needing immediate assistance at the same time, multifunctions, some of a technical nature, conducted simultaneously, the immediate involvement of federal and state agencies, and the overwhelming response of the national media. At the World Trade Center attack in 2001, numerous persons needed urgent and immediate assistance from all emergency responding agencies at the same time. This incident pointed out the need and importance for carrying out multi-functions. The fire service was impacted with the need for both evacuation and fire attack to save trapped persons. The emergency medical service was very active, with numerous persons injured and having to make arrangements for the expected deluge of injured persons at the hospitals. Law enforcement personnel were very busy as well, controlling traffic, providing crowd control, and assisting in evacuations. This incident required multi-functions to be carried out simultaneously and be coordinated in a manner to optimize limited resources. Soon, federal government agencies arrived at the scene. The FBI wanted to start a crime investigation process while the incident was still active. This need to conduct multiple functions provided by local, state, and federal agencies at the same time and in the same location while still maintaining overall coordination and control resulted in the 2003 Presidential Directive 5 to the Department of Homeland Security to establish and develop a National Incident Management System, NIMS. Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5 was followed by Directive 7 and Directive 8, which required NIMS to be not just a new version of the Incident Command System, but to incorporate all aspects of preparing for and managing incidents. This new comprehensive system contains the following components. Command and Management, Preparedness Resource Management, Communications and Information Management, and Supporting Technologies in Ongoing Management and Maintenance. ICS is the command and management component. The NIM system will be used to provide the coordination and control of multi-jurisdictional incidents. Joint multifunctional efforts need to have a comprehensive and coordinated plan which will be developed using the NIMS under the direction of a unified command. Resulting from the circumstances of September 11th, the news media on a national scale immediately overwhelmed the incident needing answers that were not yet available. At a WMD incident such as this, the information flowing from the news media may have a national impact on the public confidence in government. Therefore, news releases must be carefully constructed, be accurate and complete. All of these factors make a WMD incident a challenging, difficult task that can be only successfully handled with careful pre-incident planning joint exercises, and training to use a variety of specialized equipment. Since the 1940s, there have been a dramatic increase in the number and variety of hazardous materials, resulting in more hazardous material incidents. As the amount of transportation and handling of these materials grows daily, so do the incidents. The increase in responding to unwanted releases of these substances has prompted federal and state governments to put into effect regulations to manage the use and control of these substances. First responders in the United States have developed a warning system to assist them in the identification of these hazardous materials. These systems are DOT and then FPA placard systems. The DOT identifies materials being transported across state lines and the NFPA system identifies buildings where materials are handled or stored. Starting with the original 1993 World Trade Center bombing, followed by the 1995 Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing, and then the 2001 terrorist attacks in the World Trade Center, there have been a rapid increase in the use of substances that we now define as weapons of mass destruction. In response to the, this increase in terrorist activities, the National Incident Management System has been developed to plan for and coordinate the efforts of all agencies concerned with incidents of weapons of mass destruction. 
One way fire departments can prepare for these types of incidents is by reviewing lessons learned by other first responders and building upon these learning experiences. Using the information gained from these experiences of others will assist them to safely control and protect the citizens and communities.